All right, greetings and good morning, saints. It is truly the greatest privilege and the most distinguishable honor to be counted among God's flock and granted access into his congregation to worship his holy name on his holy day. Truly the Sabbath was made for man. It is an unprecedented pleasure to come before his throne to praise his glorious name and to rest from our labor. Therefore, let us spend not only the next few hours, but the whole of the day in the public and private exercises of worship, even as we owe it to him for the sake of his authority, sovereignty, his office as creator and preserver, and even more so as he is the redeemer and savior of our souls, and has given his life for us unto death. Another sun has risen on us, therefore let it be the sun in our hearts, offering him the worship due to his name for his blessed work for us and in us. 1 Peter 1 verses 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, which is prepared to be revealed in the last time. We are begotten again unto a living hope, and one that fadeth not away. Therefore let us go to our suffering, yea, even to the cross itself with joy, even as Christ did before us as our surety and example. For it must not be that Christ was crowned with thorns, and we with roses. As we are his people, we must also bear the crown of thorns, grief, disappointment, persecution, but the end thereof, everlasting life. Therefore, be patient and wait for it, Christian. It is only a short time on this earth. And therefore, let us come to his word with hope and confidence, knowing that he will work in us his precious grace, despite, yea, even by the many trials that cross us. Let us come to his word with prayer and thanksgiving, knowing that we are blessed beyond comprehension, having access to the Father through Jesus Christ, who is revealed in the word. And so let's pray. Our holy and righteous Father, eternal and unchangeable, merciful, compassionate and faithful, full of all justice and righteousness, and who will not acquit the guilty, we do come before thee in solemn reverence and abject humility, acknowledging thy incomprehensible greatness, holiness, excellency and majesty, in whose presence we do now in a special manner appear, as well as our own vileness and unworthiness to approach so near unto thee in worship. We freely confess that apart from the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would be justly cast from thy sight, for we admit our guilt, pollution, and utter inability to the right performance of so great and monument a work as the reading of thy holy word in worship, prayer, preaching, and hearing the word with reverence undoubtedly are, apart from grace. And therefore because of this, because by thy word we are convinced that thou art merciful and gracious to the brokenhearted and humble, and do equip thy servants for their calling by thine own virtue, we do beseech thee to pardon our weakness, assist us in the performance of the work, and accept our worship for the sake of Christ, in the whole service here to be performed. And we do pray for a special blessing on that particular portion of thy word here to be read in the assembly of the saints, whom thou hast called thy special possession and thy little flock, we pray for blessing only in the name and through the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our prophet, priest, and king. Amen. All right, we are continuing on our um, reading and study of Psalm 19, an excellent psalm, a most worthy psalm, um, most expressive of Christian doctrine of what we have before said is especially stated in the first chapter of our beloved Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, saying that the light of nature, uh, they do it does so far manifest the glory of God as to leave man without excuse, yet it is not sufficient to convert them and to bring them up in the faith. Um, such an office um, is reserved for the Word of God, the Word of God being in times past, the word of God spoken to the fathers and the prophets, as Hebrews 1 says, God, who at various times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. 
um, and more especially and particularly by the Word of God as it is written, as it is a written tradition. Um, and more particularly, the exposition and preaching of the Word, which is nothing else than the proper and correct explanation of the Word of God, which is written. And so that the Word of God does not exist merely in the letter, but is living and powerful and mighty in operation, as Hebrew says, which we will hear speak about. And as the Word is living and powerful, so it is used by the preacher and explained properly to, me to reach men's consciences, not only their deeds. Surely many times you have heard in the church today uh, the Calvinists, those who call themselves Reformed, speaking about many things. Things that you ought to do, such as pray, such as worship, so to, such as go to church, being a part of your Christian community, as they say. And many things you ought to avoid. Some things truly we ought to avoid. And some things are merely misspoken because out of a misguided zeal, um, they would abolish works which are lawful, yet being abused, uh, they become unlawful, such as certain forms of recreation um, and um, things that Christians may enjoy in a good conscience according to this life. Um, so that their, the substance of their ministry is only and is excluded to the uh, the deeds, the physical, that which we can see and that which uh, men and women are inclined to do. But the Word of God is not such. The Word of God, properly exposited and preached, reaches to the soul and conscience. And so when we speak and when we exposit Scripture and when we uh, aim to... Uh, explain the mysteries of the faith and the gospel, we relate to men's consciences, to their very heart, whether or not it, they apply this to themselves, and whether or not this word reaches to their inmost being. As Calvin says here in his comments, which we will read, uh, we are not converted unless the word does a thorough work upon our soul. It is not enough for us to simply read the word. It is not enough for us to simply um, speak of it, even if it is um, regular, as uh, pastors or Christian leaders may have a regular attendance upon the Word. It is not enough for us to understand some things about the Word, as the life of David, or the difference between Israel and the other nations, or what forms of idolatry these nations were given to so that you as a person do not bow down to a physical golden calf but the scripture is spiritual and speaks about spiritual things so that when the scripture speaks about uh, Israel bowing down to a golden calf um, and warning us of idolatry so that Moses the prophet of God commanded the Levites to slay their own brethren and uh, there died that day many thousands of men um, who committed idolatry? Uh, we are not. We do not restrict that passage to an absolute historical context, so that it only means a golden calf. It only means Moses did something, and um, as a, an officer in a unique time, um, commanded that men fall upon their brethren and kill them. Uh, but we extend this. Um, context to our own um, relevant spheres so that this is a warning against all idolatry and uh, this is not only referring to men and women bowing down to a golden calf but to any form um, that takes shape in the mind of God that is not God that is created of our own fancy so it is speaking about idolatry it is not only speaking of a golden calf and so when the word is preached, as we will see here, as Psalm 19 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. We mean that it reaches to the conscience and to the intention, to the motive, to the affections, to the mind and the will. And that is why the first thing we stress is doctrine. Because doctrine, being apprehended, is received by the mind. The mind is what understands and grasps information. 
according to what is either pleasing or distasteful. And except we have a relish for the word, that is, it reaches to our affections, and the word of God, as we understand it correctly, is tasteful to us, and that we relish it and delight in it, it is sure that we are not truly converted. That is why Calvin says here in his exposition on Hebrews that the word must do a thorough work upon the soul. It must reach our minds. We must understand it. It must reach our affections. We must love it. And it must reach our will too. We must be inclined to perform that which is commanded in the word. That is why we do not stress particulars so much, although particulars are necessary when the time comes. If questions are to be asked about cases of conscience, whether such and such be lawful or unlawful, but for the most part, the exposition of the word is not particulars, but is in doctrine, and is in doctrine that is to be stressed in a way that the people are commanded and exhorted to love it uh, as the word of God that delivers them from death. For it is sure that except they be converted by the word of God and have a relish for the word of God as it is spoken correctly um, by a true minister, it is sure that they shall not receive eternal life. This is life and death, as we have before stated in many uh, sermons beforehand, that this central message which we preach is everlasting life, apart from which there is no salvation. And so that is what we mean when we speak of, that is what the psalm says when it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Um, very common today is the preaching against certain practices. Very common in my own church was the practice of not going to the evening service and instead spending the time either at the theater or other places of entertainment. Now, while this is a, a true statement that it is sinful to um, abstain from the evening service, which is the worship of God on his holy day, and yes, men are to be uh, rebuked for sin, uh, yet the point at hand was never discussed. The central point, which is that men's hearts were inclined to this world, and therefore they were slaves to this world, and therefore they would have been rightly called unbelievers, because it was not just a um, an occasional thing. Something came up, and they were unable to attend God's worship in the evening. But... Um, they were after their idols, and they would not be worshiping God because their affections did not drive them to the worship of God. And so the heart was never touched, but only the bare practice. And so are we saying that um, the bare practice should not be spoken against? No, but when we, but the word of God does not simply and only speak of the practice, and this is proof of a false and unconverted and hypocritical minister who only can touch upon the practice and never reach to the very soul of the matter which is first understanding of doctrine secondly an affection for god which causes them to desire to worship god on his sabbath day in the evening and thirdly that it inclines the will so that even if they should do it but yet be unwilling the work remains incomplete and they still are enslaved to their sin as is no doubt the case with those who did make it to the evening service. They did not do it out of a sincere love for God, but out of respect for man and their traditions which they were willing to follow for their own sakes and not for the glory of God. And that is why when we preach, we speak of when the word of God quickens, it quickens our whole soul. It does a thorough work so that we are humbled and brought to salvation by the word. And so this is the import of Psalm 19, the latter half, when it speaks of the office of the Word of God, which is of utmost importance to us. And so we can see that Psalm 19 is a most excellent psalm, extremely informative, and truly it is to our blessing and eternal life if we take heed and take note of its doctrine. And so we're going to read again the latter half of Psalm 19. Uh, with a brief exposition on what we just touched upon, and then we are going to read Calvin's comments on Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which says that the word of God is living and mighty in operation, sharper than any two-edged sword, because if there was ever a parallel passage that spoke exactly according to the line of another scripture, this is a prime example. 
Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and mighty in operation, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So what does this mean, that the law of the Lord converts the soul? And what does it mean that it is living and mighty in operation? Um, this is where we separate from the Roman Catholics um, and the Baptists and also the modern uh, Reformed Church also today, um, which, as we have said before, they only have a material view of Scripture and not a spiritual view. And so there is much to be gleaned and learned here from the ca comments from Calvin on another verse. And so we have here Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14, and then an exposition thereon. And then after, there is going to be a reading of Calvin's comments, which are most excellent. Um, and then also take note of Calvin's comments as the sermon and lesson today is going to be on taking up the cross and following after Christ as central to the substance of the doctrine of Christ. Take note at the, of the beginning of Calvin's exposition because the first couple of statements that Calvin says are exactly to the point of taking up the cross because we cannot take up the cross except we be spiritually mortified and die to self, dead to self. Um, and therefore, Calvin's comments are not only useful for this point at hand, which is the office of the Word of God, but also for the sermon as well. So keep that in mind. So Psalm 19, the latter half, uh, David writes, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. So shall I be upright and made clean from much wickedness. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Now, Previously, we looked at the beauty and symmetry of this psalm, how the structure thereof is threefold. First, to show us the office of the heavens, which is to leave men without excuse for their atheism and idolatry. Secondly, to show us the office of the law, which is to convert, convict, and sanctify believers through the knowledge thereof. Thirdly, and finally, to show the effect of the law on the heart, which is to change our inward man, causing us to walk in conformity to God, which pleases him. As David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Previously saying that the law of the Lord is perfect and more to be desired is his law than gold, yea, than much fine gold. And therefore we see that walking in conformity to God's law is that which pleases him. As we have spent time observing the office of the heavens and the office of the law, we will now proceed to examine more closely what it is in the law which is most effectual in conversion. For it is written, For the word of God is living and mighty in operation, and sharper than any two-edged sword, and entereth through, even unto the dividing asunder of the soul and of the spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart." showing forth in the most conspicuous of terms that the law is powerful to work upon man's soul by preaching, as a sword is powerful in the hands of a capable fighter. Therefore, it is the duty of the preacher to study Scripture, to know Scripture, to meditate on Scripture, and to know his own heart also, that he might be successful to drive back evil from the hearts of his hearers, and point them effectually in the ways of righteousness. Now it must be first noted that although the word of God be used by the minister thereof to convert souls, yet it is the office and power of God alone that does the work, causing the word to take root and revealing to the darkened mind of man those secrets which the minister can only set forth before their eyes. That is why Martin Luther said during the Reformation that he did nothing, that the word of God did all. Therefore the duty of the ministry is upon the man. 
But the credit and power belongs only to God, who alone can soften man's hard heart by the work of the Spirit. Nevertheless, a minister is obligated under the strictest of regulations to study to show himself approved, and well studied in the knowledge of God, despite his want of contribution. Yea, though he labor tirelessly, read many books, and preach many sermons, yet the power of God, it is of the power of God, and he can make the best of sermons utterly ineffectual, either as a present judgment upon the hearers, or to humble the preacher and make him the more reliant on the power of God for success. Nevertheless, we must not conclude by this that the ministry has no or little authority from God, for the words of the preacher are spoken from his own mouth, so that you might have life, and in rejecting the words of God's ministers, you reject the words of eternal life. Therefore we conclude that the preacher is a tool in the hands of God, and the word is the tool in the hands of the preacher, and is the chief and particular means which God uses to bring sinners to himself. For the preacher is called for that purpose, either to be the minister of justification and bring sinners from enmity con to conformity, or to be the minister of sanctification and bring a soul from despair to contentment, from idleness to activity, or from affection towards the world to devotion to God, or of destruction when men do not turn from sin, but continue on in idolatry to their own eternal shame. Then does the minister reconcile sinners to God, when they amend their ways and pursue righteousness rather than vanity. As it is written, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Therefore we do, do we use many words to persuade you of the truth and power of God, so that if it turn but one away from the error of his ways, or comfort one saint under grief or despair, much harm to their soul will be prevented, and it will be as the saving of their life from destruction. Therefore, though many sermons full of sweat and labor prove ineffectual, yet though one take root and convince a sinner to turn but from one evil, we count it a marvelous thing, and praise God for it, for that he hath opened the eyes of the blind, and raised the dead back to life. And we continue on, boldly preaching the word despite the obstacles, knowing that it is of God to quicken, and for God to blind in judgment. Yet are we called to preach." Such is the operation of the word upon men's souls as pertaining to the ministry of the word and the duty of the minister to use the law as a word to quicken. And we have also here comments from Calvin on Hebrews 4.12, which is a most excellent statement on the work of the law upon men's hearts, also the duty and office of the minister. You can see that Calvin has a profound and complete understanding of the text in hand. Calvin says on Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick or living. What he says here of the efficacy or power of the word, he says it that they might know that it could not be despised with impunity, as though he had said, whenever the Lord addresses us by his word, he deals seriously with us in order that he may touch all our inmost thoughts and feelings. And so there is no part of our soul which ought not to be roused. But before we proceed further, we must inquire whether the Apostle speaks of the effect of the word generally or refers only to the faithful. It, endears, it indeed appears evident that the word of God is not equally efficacious in all. For in the elect it exerts its own power. When humbled by a true knowledge of themselves, they flee to the grace of Christ. And this is never the case except when it penetrates into the innermost heart. For hypocrisy must be sifted, which has marvelous and extremely winding recesses in the hearts of men. And then we must not be slightly pricked or torn, but be thoroughly wounded, that being prostrate under a sense of eternal death, we may be taught to die to ourselves. In short, we shall never be renewed in the whole mind, which Paul requires, Ephesians 4.23, until our old man be slain by the edge of the spiritual sword. Hence Paul says in another place that the faithful are offered as a sacrifice to God by the gospel, for they cannot otherwise be brought to obey God than by having, as it were, their own will slain. Nor can they otherwise receive the light of God's wisdom than by having the wisdom of the flesh destroyed. Nothing of this kind is found in the reprobate, for they either carelessly disregard God speaking to them and thus mock him, or clamor against his truth, and obstinately resist it. In short, as the word of God is a hammer, so they have a heart like an anvil, so that its hardness repels its strokes. 
however powerful they may be. The word of God, then, is far from being efficacious towards them as to penetrate into them to the dividing of the soul and the spirit. Hence it appears that this its character is to be confined to the faithful only, as they alone are thus searched to the quick. Here, Calvin is separating the general from the particular, how the word of God is efficacious to all men as to leave them uh, without further excuse. And it is, in the particular, efficacious only to the elect insofar that it reaches our hearts, and God by his Spirit regenerates us by it. And so he says that the reprobate have certain marks of them, that it is a mark of the reprobate that they mock or clamor against the truth or obstinately resist it. And so if we find those resisting the truth of the word of God, it may be a sign of reprobation, that it is a certain sign of they, them being outside the faith. But the word of God works in the elect, and that is a mark of our election, that we can prove our election, that the word of God is efficacious in us and that we believe it. Calvin goes on to say, the context, however, shows that there is here a general truth, and which extends also to the reprobate themselves. For though they are not softened, but set up a brazen and an iron heart against God's word, yet they must necessarily be restrained by their own guilt. They indeed laugh, but it is a sardonic laugh, for they inwardly feel that they are, as it were, slain. They make evasions in various ways, so as not to come before God's tribunal. But though unwilling, they are yet dragged there by this very word which they arrogantly deride, so that they may be fitly compared to furious dogs, which bite and claw the chain by which they are bound, and yet can do nothing as they still remain fast bound. And further, though this effect of the word may not appear immediately, as it were on the first day, yet it will be found at length by the event, that it has not been preached to any one in vain. General, no doubt, is what Christ declares when he says, When the Spirit shall come, he will convince the world, for the Spirit exercises this office by the preaching of the gospel. And lastly, though the word of God does not always exert its power on man, yet it has in a manner included in itself. And the apostle speaks here of its character and proper office for this only, that they may know that our consciences are summoned as guilty before God's tribunal as soon as it sounds in our ears. As though he had said, if anyone thinks that the air is beaten by an empty sound when the word of God is preached, he is greatly mistaken, for it is a living thing and full of hidden power, which leaves nothing in man untouched. The sum of the whole, then, is this, that as soon as God opens his sacred mouth, all our faculties ought to be open to receive his word, for he would not have his word scattered in vain, so as to disappear or fall neglected on the ground, but he would have it effectually to constrain the consciences of men so as to bring them under his authority, and that he has put power in his word for this purpose, that it may scrutinize all the parts of the soul, search the thoughts, discern the affections, and in a word show itself to be the judge." Here you can see Calvin speaking of the overreaching and absolute nature of the law that it touches upon not only every part of our soul, but every part of every part of that faculty. And so that every part of the understanding is searched and judged by the word, every part of the affections, and every part of the will also, so that we are left condemned by its holiness and purity. This is to drive us the further to forgiveness in Christ. Uh, when we fall short of it. For even if we be inclined to a specific duty and perform that duty, um, as we have daily responsibilities to devotion to God as the reading of the word and prayer, yet if we come to this duty with an unready heart and without full affections and without being wholly inclined to that work, we still fall short of the purity and perfection required in that work. And therefore we must ask for forgiveness even for those things that we perform that are according to the word of God, as prayer is required and reading of the word is required, family worship, etc. Yet if we come to these duties um, hypocritically or unready or without zeal in them, then it is a work incorrectly performed. Not only the matter, but the manner also is required. And therefore, 
we must ask for God's patience to bear with our weakness and infirmity and that he would accept the work through Christ even as there is part of God's work in it as we are willing as we do understand that it is our duty and that we are inclined to perform it uh, despite our weaknesses this is the confidence that is required in the gospel confidence that Christ will work for us making us acceptable in God's sight and in us uh, preparing us for the work itself and so you can see Calvin says here that the Word of God reaches our inmost beings it says so as to bring them under his authority and that he has put power in his word for this purpose that it may scrutinize all the parts of the soul search the thoughts discern the affections and in a word show itself to be the judge Calvin continues but here a new question arises is this word to be understood of the law or of the gospel those who think that the apostle speaks of the law bring these testimonies of Paul, that it is the ministration of death, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, that it is the letter which killeth, but that worketh nothing but wrath, Romans 4, 15, and similar passages. But here the apostle points out also its different effects, for as we have said that there is a certain vivifying killing of the soul, which is affected by the gospel. Let us then know that the Apostle speaks generally of the truth of God when he says that it is living and efficacious. So Paul, testified, Paul, Paul testifies when he declares that by his preaching there went forth an odor of death unto death to the unbelieving, but of life unto life to believers, 2 Corinthians 2.16, so that God never speaks in vain. He draws some to salvation, others he drives into ruin. Here we can see that Calvin says that God drives the reprobate into ruin, that it is intentional, that it is the will of God that the reprobate perish. This is important because God's word, if it takes root in our soul, it must be by God's will that it takes root in our soul. And if God's word does, then we will believe that word, which speaks of God's word as efficacious and not our own will. And therefore, if we believe in free will or in the effort of man, we have learned nothing and we are not truly converted. God's word must take deep root in us so that we believe it. And that is why Calvin says here that he draws some to salvation, others he drives into ruin. This is the power of binding and loosing which the Lord conferred on his apostles, Matthew 18, 18. And indeed he never promises to us salvation in Christ without denouncing, on the other hand, vengeance on unbelievers, who by rejecting Christ bring death on themselves. Here, uh, we can see in the statement by Calvin uh, that he says exactly what we spoke of last week uh, when we said that Psalm 19 speaks of the law and the gospel, the whole truth and doctrine of God in general, as we saw also from Matthew Poole. So that when Calvin here speaks of this question, is this word to be understood of the law or of the gospel, it must be considered as the truth of God in general. Calvin continues, It must be further noticed that the apostle speaks of God's word, which is brought to us by the ministry of men. For delirious and even dangerous are those notions that, though the internal word is efficacious, yet that which proceeds from the mouth of man is lifeless and destitute of all power. I indeed admit that the power does not proceed from the tongue of man, nor exists in mere sound, but that the whole power is to be ascribed altogether to the Holy Spirit. There is, however, nothing in this to hinder the Spirit from putting forth his power in the word preached. For God, as he speaks not by himself, but by men, dwells carefully on this point, so that his truth may not be objected to in contempt, because men are its ministers. So Paul, by saying that the gospel is the power of God, Romans 1.16, designedly adorned with this distinction his own preaching, though he saw that it was slandered by some and despised by others. And when in another place, in Romans 10.8, he teaches us that salvation is conferred by the doctrine of faith, he expressly says that it was the doctrine which was preached. We indeed find that God ever commends the truth administered to us by men in order to induce us to receive it with reverence. Now, by calling the word quick or living, he must be understood as referring to men, which appears still clearer by the second word, powerful. For he shows what sort of life it possesses, when he expressly says that it is efficacious. For the apostle's object was to teach us what the word is to us. The sword is a metaphorical word often used in scripture. But the apostle, not content with simple comparison, says that God's word is sharper than any sword, even than a sword that cuts on both sides, or two-edged, for at that time swords were in common use, which were blunt on one side and sharp on the other. 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, or to the dividing of the soul and spirit, etc. The word soul means often the same with spirit, but when they occur together, the first includes all the affections, and the second means what they call the intellectual faculty. So Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, uses the words when he prays God to keep their spirit and soul and body blameless until the coming of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 He meant no other thing but that they might continue pure and chaste in mind and will and outward actions. As also Isaiah means the same thing when he says, My soul desired thee in the night, I sought thee with my spirit. What he doubtless intends to show is that he was so intent on seeking God that he applied his whole mind and his whole heart. I know that some give a different explanation, but all the sound-minded, as I expect, will assent to this view. Now to come to the passage before us, it is said that God's word pierces or reaches to the dividing of soul and spirit. That is, it, ex it examines the whole soul of man, for it searches his thoughts and scrutinizes his will with all its desires. And then he adds the joints and marrow, intimating that there is nothing so hard or strong in man, nothing so hidden, that the powerful word cannot pervade it. Paul declares the same thing when he says that prophecy avails to reprove and to judge men so that the secrets of the heart may come to light. And as it is Christ's office to uncover and bring to light the thoughts from the recesses of the heart, this he does for the most part by the gospel. Hence, God's word is a discerner, one that has power to discern, for it brings the light of the knowledge to the mind of man as it were from a labyrinth where it was held before entangled. There is indeed no thicker darkness than that of unbelief, and hypocrisy is a horrible blindness. But God's word scatters this darkness and chases away this hypocrisy. Hence the separating or discerning, which the apostle mentions, for the vices hid under the false appearance of virtues, begin then to be known, the varnish being wiped away. And if the reprobate remain for a time in their hidden recesses, yet they find at length that God's word has penetrated there also, so that they cannot escape God's judgment. Hence their clamor and also their fury, for they were not smitten by the word, they would not thus betray their madness, but they would seek to elude the word, or by evasion to escape from its power, or to pass by unnoticed. But these things God does not allow them to do. Whenever they slander God's word or become enraged against it, they show that they feel within its power, however unwillingly and reluctantly. Here ends Calvin's comments on Hebrews 4, verses 12. And so we see here at the end that the word of God has a particular work on the elect to regenerate us and to cause us to believe and also a work in the reprobate. That is, the, the word of God does work in them, it cuts them, but it works in a different manner. That is, it condemns them and they see by it that their malice against God, their enmity against their neighbor, not only is just unjustified, but is condemned in the sight of God and that God will judge them by it. That is why when we uh, speak to them of these things, they do not remain calm and composed, but immediately rage against us as malefactors um, and is harmful to their conscience. That is why they, unbelievers, are the ones who use the passage from Matthew, judge not lest ye be judged, uh, because they are using it because they do not want to be judged by the word, because they are enraged against the truth of the word. And here, there, here Calvin ends his comments by showing the work that the word does in those who do not believe, uh, that it, rather than quickening them and causing them to live according to it, and according to the statutes that it implies, they reject it, and they rage against it, but it still works in them and shows that God's power is overreaching even to the conscience, slaying the wicked by it and slaying our old man in us by it so that we might be new creatures. And so that is the first principle which we shall learn in the lesson and the sermon today um, in the on the subject of taking up the cross and following after Christ. And so before we begin, let us pray to God for blessing upon it um, in accordance with that we have sinned and we require mercy. And so let's pray. Our heavenly and righteous Father in heaven, we have sinned and brought ill upon ourselves. 
We must, con we must confess that all our misery that cometh upon us in this life cometh of our own doing. For who can look within himself and judge by the law that he is clean? Are we not all polluted and corrupt? Have we not all fallen short of the perfection of duty required in the law? Have we not transgressed much? Yea, and our sins are not yet wholly mortified. For there is a fountain in our bosom that daily issues forth new offenses worthy to be punished. Great is thy mercy towards us, O God. Great is thy faithfulness and loving kindness towards thy people, whom thou hast purchased for thine own possession. Although we have purchased for ourselves misery and condemnation, yet thou hast in pity to our soul purchased for us the forgiveness of sins, and an eternal abode with thee in heaven. What then if our lives here are full of pain? Have we not merited it? And is there not an eternity of bliss awaiting us in heaven? Then let us put on this mind even as Christ did, despising the shame of the cross and running the race with joy, though his way was full of thorns and briars, and he deserved none of it. Let us be patient under trial, for we bear only what we bring upon ourselves, as we have all infinitely offended in our own persons. Accept us, therefore, through Jesus Christ our righteousness, and may we ever live to bless and worship his name in the midst of, despite, and even for the cause of our afflictions. For we know that he hath power to bless them and make them turn rather for our everlasting good, to mortify sin in us and exercise patience. Even so may it be, and may the name of Jesus Christ be ever blessed, who turns our afflictions into everlasting joy. In the name of the Lord Jesus we cry, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray, Amen. All right, continuing on our series on the substance of the doctrine of Christ from the statement of Thomas Manton, would that parents but begin and labor um, to show and demonstrate to their children the efficacious nature of this doctrine, uh, to acquaint them with the substance of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. So we are speaking of what the substance of the doctrine of Christ is, so that we might declare it to our children also. Uh, for the substance of our message is eternal life, as we have before said. And this it will be the final lesson on this section on the substance of the doctrine of Christ. We spoke of the doctrine of sin, how it is necessary for us to know and understand Jesus Christ. Just as we um, just read from Calvin's comments, uh, that except we be humbled by the law and quickened thoroughly and brought and convinced by uh, unto the grace of Christ, unless we are convinced of the grace of Christ, that God's grace is necessary, that the imputation of righteousness is necessary, it is sure that we know nothing of Jesus Christ as he is preached and spoken of in the scriptures. We spoke of the doctrine of election, that election not only speaks of an arbitrary or a... Um, a doctrine separated from the rest of the idea or concept of redemption as the antinomians would separate it from the covenant of grace, denying the covenant of works. Um, but when we speak of election, we speak of the covenant of grace in Christ. We are elected in Jesus Christ as members of his church and congregation members of his body as he is the head so we exist and have life in him and as the head um, is the central control point and tower for the rest of the body the head and mind dictates where the body goes so christ does in his own body and his church and so our sanctification depends upon the virtue and power of our head and therefore there is no doubt but that we will be sanctified we have confidence that we will be sanctified as christ is our head and this is comfort to us because that is our chief desire in this life to be sanctified and to be brought under subjection to jesus christ our head even as um, a wife submits to her husband. We submit to Christ as our head, and that is our desire in life, to please him in all things. And so we are on the final lesson as we discussed sin, as we discussed election, as we discussed uh, propitiation and the imputation of righteousness, as we discussed also the work of the Spirit, which is 
the completion of the Holy Trinity, the Father in election, the Son in redemption, in propitiation, in the imputation of righteousness, and the work of the Spirit, which is to give us faith and unite us to Christ, to cause us to believe by the preaching of the Word. And we also spoke of the preaching of the Word being efficacious, being the means by which God delivers us from wrath. Um, Thomas Watson had many excellent statements on the means of grace. And so, ordinarily, we have to conclude that there is no believer, but that he has been delivered the word by a preacher, a capable minister, able to um, uncover the mysteries of the faith and bring a soul from death to life. Um, that is how God brings sinners to salvation, by the preaching of the word. And as we also spoke of the means of grace and the work of the Spirit, we must finally discuss the general tenor of our life. We spoke of holiness and sanctification, what our life consists of, that it consists of purity and of sincerity before God, according to the soul and not only according to the bare actions. And so finally we are on the closing argument, which is um, that which we suffer in this life on a daily basis, which is life under the cross. And so the final lesson of the substance of the doctrine of Christ is um, the life of suffering, um, whether it be according to God's providence, or whether it be the malice of men, or whether it be the mortification and self-denial which is required in the law. And so we're going to be speaking about all of these things. What life under the cross entails and what Christ means when he says, take up your cross and follow me. Um, because many mistake on this point, especially the legalists, the legalists we know, um, the Baptists love to preach on um, the cross of Christ and taking up your cross and mortifying sin, etc. Uh, but they cannot preach rightly uh, because of it, even the first point, which is the law and the gospel. They call Arminians believers, and if you call an Arminian believer, um, you are saying that you do not need to be convinced of the word of God in order to be saved, but you can be re utterly remain unconvinced that the word has any truth, and you can have your own private interpretation of the word of God, your own ideas of what the word of God means, which utterly removes the means of grace that men are brought to salvation by a preacher who is capable in understanding and in um, explaining the mysteries of the faith, um, you have to conclude that a person does not need a preacher or to be convinced of the truth of the word. And therefore, they have not even come to the first point at hand, which is to be humbled by the law. Uh, but before we get started on these points, which are necessary for our understanding of living under the cross, we're going to read uh, the statements in which Christ exhorts his disciples to take up their cross that we might see the general context and apply it to and apply it rightly so that we do not miss the mark but that what we aim for in preaching might be efficacious so here the first time it is spoken was is matthew 10 verses 34 through 39 Jesus says to his disciples, this is him speaking specifically to his disciples and speaking of the ministry. As you can see, the, the chapter 10 is concerning sending out his 12 disciples to preach the word. It says in the beginning of chapter 10, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, these were ministers, these were, were not private individuals, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now there are some, um, in the history of the church and in today's church who say that God's ministers still have the power to cast out unclean spirits and to heal all manner of sickness and disease. Uh, but we restrict this certain and particular gift to the apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ, the extraordinary gifts of healing not being necessary anymore. God meant for a time to show the efficaciousness and power of his word to leave men without excuse for their unbelief, to demonstrate the glory of Christ for a time, and so he gave his disciples power over um, unclean spirits and healing. But the word of God has a more potent and powerful effect in the preaching of the word, in that it drives and casts out darkness and demons that plague men's souls, as Thomas Watson writes in his own exposition. 
um, in the times of the apostles, um, demons possessed men's bodies, but now demons possess men's souls. It makes they make them covetous. They make them uh, lusting after this world, etc. And so there is a much more potent and powerful effect of the ministry that it has upon men in that it works upon the soul. And so we have no need of healing um, physical infirmities uh, because it is most, much more important for us to understand and know the reason for our affliction, which is to exercise patience. And so we have to conclude that although ministers do not have the gift of healing as was um, in the ministry of the apostles, the disciples of Christ here in this passage, yet they have a much more um, important ministry, not more important than the disciples, but more important than the gift of healing in particular, which is to save souls, which is the healing of their soul, which is the bringing of sinners from death unto life as we before discussed in Calvin on Psalm 19 and in Hebrews 4. And so it says at the beginning, you can see the context is Christ sending his disciples. He says the names of the disciples were these. He says to his disciples in verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and enter any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we can see that at Israel, God's covenant people were first to be proclaimed the gospel message, and then when they rejected it, they were found unworthy, and then the gospel went also to the Gentiles. This was for God's covenant purposes to be fulfilled, that they might be stirred up in jealousy to receive the word of grace, because the Gentiles also received it. You can see Paul speaking of that in Romans 10 and 11. Uh, but this, in context, Christ is speaking to his disciples, the preachers of the word. And he says in verse 34, which is where we will begin for the context, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. So is Christ here speaking of um, a physical battle that ministers are to have, that is, um, disciples are to take up a sword and slay our enemies. No, he's speaking of the confrontation that the gospel will have before men, that it will be opposite to men's natural affections. And then he immediately says, For I come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Who here, under, who, is being, who has been brought under the power of the ministry of the gospel, cannot say that they have also experienced this variance against father, against daughter, against um, those of their own household. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. This shows the contest and opposition that the gospel has with those who are most who are closest and most dear to us according to the natural affections, which is family. Um, that is why in other places in Scripture it commands with such strictness to marry only those in the faith because we are not commanded to bring those who are enemies of the gospel close to us, but as we are brought into the faith as part of a family, those members of the family who were not chosen and elected by God, who are not quickened by the word, are enemies to us and therefore um, this is this shows what the context here is speaking of which is a warfare not of a physical warfare not of violence but of spiritual variance that is they have views that are opposed to us and we have views that are opposed to them the gospel separates one from another. It does not bring us in peace with them, which is why we can call this new doctrine that is forming demonic, uh, which seeks peace with other denominations. Um, as um, one of the chief heretics of our day, C.S. Lewis, wrote in one of his books, um, that he does not come to uh, persuade someone to be either a Pentecostal or a Episcopalian or a Baptist or a Catholic. And he says, and he exhorts people not to worry about doctrinal differences. But then he says he comes to preach the simple word of Christianity, which is not Christianity, but is um, a demonic form of um, interfaith, that all faiths are accepted, as C.S. Lewis says in another place, that those outside the faith may be members of Christ without realizing it. 
and that is exactly what other Christians today believe, or I should say false Christians, those who call themselves Christians, especially in the Reformed Church, calling those who believe in free will fellow believers, which is anathema, which is a curse. But Christ says here that he has come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. We are commanded, in the strictest of terms, to conform to God's law despite what our family says and if they should command us to do something evil or expect us to do something against our conscience we should hold fast and true to scripture despite the inward turmoil that it might bring or the outward affliction that it might bring that is why he immediately says he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me he that findeth his life shall lose it and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it here we can see many um, applications for this, many doctrinal implications uh, that we can point out showing that what it is to take up the cross and follow after Christ. Uh, but for the sake of general context, we are going to be showing that he is speaking of the ministry of the gospel, the effect that the gospel has on us, and that it will immediately bring opposition in a household. Because when you believe the gospel, it is in opposition to every opinion in the world that naturally comes from man's mind whether it be catholics or whether it be evangelicals whether it be those in the reformed church whether it be atheists secularists heathen whatever whatsoever it be being saved means being opposite to the world sanctified for god and therefore he says christ immediately says um don't worry about following me um no he does not say that he doesn't say um you may continue living the living life the way you were, um, appeasing your family and living in hypocrisy. No, he says, take up your cross and follow me or you are not worthy of me. Those who are true followers of Christ are willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. That's going to be the fourth point. And so that is the context in which we are speaking of. We are speaking of the disciples of Christ, those who are called by him and regenerated by the gospel are called to live separate from the world and we shall receive rewards from Christ, but hatred and enmity and opposition from the world. Um, the second passage here is Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26, just to show the similarity of the context when he speaks of the cross. We are speaking of life under the cross, which is a subject spoken of many times in our own experience. We may have heard sermons on it, um, but what it does it really mean to live under the cross? Matthew 16, 24 through 26, it says in Matthew 16, um, we can be, we can begin for context sake with verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Verse 23, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Here you can see Christ's strict um, rebuke of Peter saying get thee behind me Satan saying that Peter's statement was an expression of self and Satan and not an expression of true Christian love because he Peter aimed to correct Christ in his path to suffering Christ's life began with preaching and ended with suffering uh, those who will be consistent followers of Jesus Christ will suffer persecution from the world. And far be it from us to hide away from this suffering, to shy away from it, or to do something in life that would prevent it and bring shame to the gospel. But if we are consistent with Christian living, we will um, live holy lives and confront evil family members when they um, come into conflict with true doctrine or holy practice. This is not to say that 
um, we um, intend to impose ourselves on them and we make conflict whenever conflict may be but that we are willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel and we do not shy away from um, expressing our difference with them on these particular points because we do, are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and so this is the context when Christ speaks of taking up the cross he is speaking chiefly and primarily about persecution that comes because of our profession of faith and because of our holy lives this is the context of living under the cross yes it involves also um, the afflictions that come upon us by the hand of God and suffering hard providence but chiefly and primarily we are speaking of suffering persecution and so that is the primary subject as it also says in Matthew 5 we're going to read for the sake of context because it is one of the most expressive statements of persecution when Jesus says uh, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, and then finally, all of this is culminated in, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Um, just this week, um, I was assaulted by um, some people on a social media page, and they said that every time I see you speak, you're speaking of the Bible and religion. Do you have anything else to speak of? And they derided me, and they said something um, base and evil, and I had a quick response about religion being the substance of all importance, and there's nothing worth speaking of other than religion. Um, but this is just an example of being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Shake off the dust from your feet. Um, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so this is the prime context in which we're speaking of, which is suffering persecution for the cross of Christ. Now, uh, first we have to um, show that persecution is not necessarily... Um, a ongoing and continuing thing. There may be times in our life where there is no one around to persecute us. Um, that is not necessarily because we are not doing right, but because um, we are not to go and seek out to be persecuted, as the Baptists do. Uh, the Baptists, because they see that persecution is an essential part of Christianity and cannot be separated from it, they go out and they yell at people and they are as abrasive and obnoxious as possible, getting in people's face and preaching to them their word, their gospel, which is a false gospel, in order that men persecute you and persecute them. And then when they receive opposition from atheists and secularists, they imagine themselves to have done a good work uh, because... Um, they think that to be persecuted means to be Christian. No. To be persecuted for the sake of the name of Christianity is not what Christ is speaking of. You can die as a martyr for a form of the Christian faith, which is a false Christian faith, and still not be accepted in the sight of God. Um, you can be a preacher in an unknown country that you are, think you're bringing the gospel to, but because you bring a false gospel, you might be martyred by the authorities and killed, uh, but it is not true Christian persecution. Christian persecution, we must first clarify, is the true gospel, and except you are suffering for the truth of the gospel, which is righteousness by imputation of, of Christ's righteousness, and acceptance to God by free grace, not by our works, but by God's mercy in Christ, and except we be suffering for the true gospel, which is regeneration by the work of the Spirit, not our own work, uh, meriting the work of the Spirit, as the Arminians believe in regeneration, a uh, faith preceding regeneration. They believe that you first believe and then God regenerates. This is a false gospel. Except you believe rightly concerning the faith, um, you are being persecuted for your own fault and therefore ought to be persecuted, and yes, by the state and the civil authorities. We believe in the punishing of heresy, and therefore the Westminster Confession rightly says in its original um, copy, uh, that the magistrates have power to suppress heresy. And so you persecution is first 
a word which we must define as to chase and follow after unto punishment. And therefore, persecution is something that comes upon believers naturally because of our acceptance of the gospel. Um, but persecution is not only and restricted to the enemies of the gospel, but we may rightly and justly persecute others when they come into conflict with the truth. And so um, persecution has to be defined. Um, and if we are persecuted, it ought to be for a good reason. A true believer even may be persecuted for an evil cause. If a believer, such as David was, um, David was the king, and David committed unlawful crimes as king when he sent Uriah to his death, uh, murdered Uriah for his wife. If David was to be um, um, rebuked for this, and chastised by his enemies so that they cursed him as Shimea cursed David for his um, taking the throne from Saul. David says, God has sent him to curse, let him curse. And David knew that he deserved it for other sins, and therefore David was persecuted for a good cause and not for an evil cause. That is that oftentimes it is right for us to be persecuted by men because we are at fault. A Christian is not perfect. And therefore, when we understand living under the cross, we have to understand rightly that persecution chiefly means to directly suffer for the sake of the gospel. Um, as Hebrews 10 also says, we can show a good passage for persecution and living under the cross. Hebrews chapter 10, where Paul says, Call to remembrance the former days, in which, after ye were illuminated, that is, regenerated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Paul is saying here that immediately after you were regenerated, you endured afflictions from men. They looked at you with shame and they said, why are you following after Paul? Paul is crazy. Paul is speaking of things that are not true. We are to follow the Jewish traditions and the rituals and Paul is speaking of something quite different. But Paul says that after you were regenerated, you were persecuted for the sake of the gospel. That is the chief and prime context in which we are speaking of. To directly suffer because of righteousness sake. That is what Jesus says in Matthew 5. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake because you are holy and you condemn the actions of the world you will be persecuted um, therefore for that cause so that is the chief context of persecution that we are suffering directly for the sake of the gospel that is the introduction to the lesson so we have some points here on living under the cross the first section is what does it mean to live under the cross first it must mean being humbled by the law. How can we be brought under the cross unless we are brought into the faith of the cross, uh, which is belief in Christ's righteousness and not our own? And this must come through a humbling of ourselves by the law, as we just saw from Calvin. Calvin says in his comments on Hebrews 4, It says, It indeed appears evident that the word of God is not equally efficacious in all, for in the elect it exerts its own power. When humbled by a true knowledge of themselves, they flee to the grace of Christ. This is the work of the law. This is regeneration. This is the beginning of living under the cross. That we cannot live under the cross except we be regenerated. That we be humbled by the law on account of our sin and accept our guilt first in Adam, then our actual transgressions, which are our own, which evidence our fault and fall in Adam. And therefore, our admission of guilt is twofold. First, we must accept the doctrine of original sin, as it is spoken of in Westminster, and first in Scripture, as Genesis 6-5, Ecclesiastes 7, um, that men are wholly inclined in themselves to do evil. And in Romans 3, they are altogether filthy and become corrupt, except that we assent to this point and accept this to our first to our condemnation 
we certainly cannot be saved. God must work this knowledge in us that we are of ourselves condemned before he shows us that we are justified and made righteous in Christ. For it is certain that none can believe in Christ except they believe that they are condemned. And this is the way that we set forth and present Christ to sinners. We don't go around like the fake Reformed church does today and like the churches in my own area, as I've heard sermon after sermon after sermon of them saying, if you're an unbeliever today, I want to reach to you and I want to say that that um, there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ, that you can be forgiven of all your sins if you just believe in Jesus Christ. No, that is not the gospel. The gospel is a word that condemns men, that says everyone is a sinner before God and he is obligated to do the whole law and except he fulfill the law, he will be damned on the last day. And then those who are wounded by this are exhorted to believe in Christ for righteousness. Only if you are touched by the feeling of the law, working upon your conscience, condemning you for your sin, will you be convinced of the need of a Savior. Then those that are convinced of this have the promise of everlasting life, so that we speak of them as unto believers, that you have believed this. That is why we are called Christian and believers. We believe in Jesus Christ, in his righteousness. So this is the first point, that we have to be humbled by the law to be brought under the cross. How can we be brought under the cross and be persecuted for the sake of the gospel if we don't believe the gospel? And then secondarily, we have to conclude that not only must we suffer for the sake of the gospel as an abstract, but in our own conscience for the sake of the gospel, as no doubt Judas, who betrayed Christ unto death, um, suffered the... Um, insults of the Jews, as the other disciples did, and suffered for the sake of the gospel in a certain sense, but was not convinced of the gospel. That is, that although he suffered by way of um, representation, that he was a member of Christ's church and professed the gospel for a time, yet although he was persecuted for the sake of the gospel that was preached by others and that even professedly might have been spoken by him, he did not suffer for the sake of the gospel in his conscience, according to intention. That is why the word of God reaches even to the soul, that our deliberate actions, that we know please God and we know our gospel truths, are that which we must suffer for. So not only must we suffer for the gospel in the sake of being part of a Christian church and suffering with those members as Christians, but we must do it conscientiously with a mind knowing that it pleases God and that we are ready to suffer what persecution comes upon us. A prime example of persecution in this life is that of the Reformed and Calvinist churches. They have many numbers. They have many pastors. They have many different denominations. They have many different local congregations. So if we were to come to them, as I have done on many occasions, and say that the Church of God must be separated from the larger churches because they are corrupt, they immediately insult us and say that we are not part of a denomination, we are not part of a local church, and therefore we are not to be regarded. This is persecution. They are calling into question the truth of our confession on the basis of either our numbers or our establishment as a local congregation, which is not a conclusive and absolute argument. God has often scattered his people, just as in the time of the Babylonian captivities, to where they were not worshiping at Jerusalem where it ought to be commanded. Do we believe in local churches? Do we believe in established congregations under a presbytery? Yes, we are Presbyterian. We believe in the Westminster. However, it is not an absolute that it is always applicable to us, for there is not a denomination for us all to come under as we are all scattered in different places. But God be praised that his gospel is preached. And so this is one example that persecution may happen to us in this life. From, the, from those who call themselves reformed. And so we must be humbled by the law and convinced of the gospel before we are able to suffer persecution. This is the first point. Uh, secondly, a, an essential point to living under the cross is self-denial. We have to live a life of holiness and sanctification in order to demonstrate that we are Christian. 
uh, God, by his grace, implants us with sanctification by the Spirit, by the virtue of Christ's blood, as God has chosen for us to be sanctified. So Christ has purchased for us that sanctification, the gift of the Spirit, and has paid for it dearly with his own blood. And the Spirit applies the virtue of Christ's blood by the word of God into our hearts and causes us to be sanctified by it. This is what it means to live under the cross, as it were, carrying our cross, that is, as a burden upon our back, that is, that we are impeded in our progress in this life. Um, so this is the immediate illusion. It points to a person bearing a cross upon his back, even as Christ did, uh, bore his cross unto death. Um, that is, we are impeded in this life for the sake of the gospel. Perhaps we have passed up a promotion which would have threatened our spiritual life, which would have made um, communion with God more difficult, and for the sake of conscience toward God, um, we passed up advancement in this life. Uh, that is, we are walking slowly in this world. That is the direct context in which Jesus speaks to his disciples, saying that he that is, uh, gains his life shall lose it. That is, if we seek after first the glory of this world, and then religion is just a thing on the side, as it is with the rest of the world, they think that they're religious, but their chief pursuit is in this world. If something should come into contest with um, their uh, life or scripture, they choose this life. Uh, they work on the Sabbath. Um, they toil beyond uh, necessity. Um, and they busy themselves uh, to be established and well-ordered in this life to the detriment of their spiritual life. Um, this is what is said when Christ says, He that finds his life will lose it. If you busy yourself in this life um, to establish yourself in this life, but neglect religion and sanctity and devotion to God, you will lose it. But he that seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added to them. Those who have faith believe that God will supply them with their needs, and therefore they have no need of busying themselves for the things of this world. That is not to say that we are not industrious, that we do not work hard, but that we first mind the things which are of Christ. As Paul says in Colossians, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall also appear with him in glory. Our life first consists of religion, of worshiping God in holiness and sanctity and devotion, and we take up the cross and follow after him, even if it impedes our advancement in this life. This is the context. Self-denial, a mortification of sin, um, putting away those sins that displease God for the sake of the gospel, and rather suffering in this life if it please God. Uh, that is the immediate context. First, to be humbled by the law and to be brought under the cross and chiefly in mortification and self-denial. To deny self, to deny pride, and to take up the cross and serve God according to true religion. That is why it says in the Proverbs that the proud in heart are abomination in the sight of God. If we are humbled by the law and brought into conformity to God, it will be according to self-denial. We will deny self, we will deny uh, pleasure if it is necessary, and we will pursue holiness and righteousness. Um, and therefore, this is the immediate context to deny self and to deny pride, to not seek after the things in this world, just as we've just quoted Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Have faith that God will supply all your needs without you pursuing it. Uh, that uh, Allow God, as it were, to provide for you and seek after him first of all. Worship and bless his holy name in daily devotions and God will supply us with all of our necessities and if it is something that God has not provided for us if it is something that we sincerely desire but that God has not given us um, then we ought to be content that either he will give it to us in time as there are many promises that God makes to us in this life to supply us with things that we need or it is not for us to have and therefore we must submit to God and his providence and deny self. We, It is lawful for us to pray for many things and to desire things of God's hand um, as a spouse or children or a house or wealth or 
um, a good name among men, and yet all these things are not necessary for us to serve and worship him. And therefore, our um, goal in life is first to serve and worship God, to give ourselves wholly to him, to devotion to him, and then all these things shall be added to you. This is a promise. Um, it does not say... Seek first the kingdom of God, and these things might be added to you. But seek first the kingdom of God, and these things shall be added to you. That is, it is our own fault if we do not possess certain things, because we do not ask them in faith. Um, and we do not seek God with a whole heart, zealously performing those things that he commands in order to the receiving of them. As it also says in John, 1 John, we receive of him whatsoever we ask because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. There is a relationship between obedience to God and receiving of those things that we ask for. But 1 John says that we receive whatsoever we ask for of him because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And so we are to deny self, we are to mortify sin, we are to zealously pursue after righteousness, and all these things shall be added to us. This is the promise of the gospel. And therefore it is living under the cross entails being humbled by the law, else we are not living under the cross at all, no matter what we suffer, as the Roman Catholics in, in times past have suffered uh, intentionally, that is, they would whip themselves, they would bleed themselves, uh, they would afflict themselves with much pain and grief, they would starve themselves, they would do many things to prove that they were zealous followers of Christ, and yet not being humbled by the law, and not being brought and convinced of Christ's righteousness in opposition to their own self-righteousness, they were not brought under the cross. Secondly, self-denial. It must be personal and uh, subjective mortification. We must be sanctified, and we must daily mortify sin, put on righteousness, and worship God in self-denial. This is what it means to live under the cross. Thirdly, our third point is bearing afflictions with patience. There are many um, um, circumstances in life which are hard and which are not according to our plan, which might be uh, might cause us grief or despair, um, but all of these are to be borne with patience, as God does not afflict us with anything unnecessarily. Everything that comes upon us is according to his fatherly promise, and it is written in the scriptures. Peter says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. This is not a particular. This is not a contextual. This is not a, um, a separated and isolated incident in which God cares for one of his people a certain particular uh, time. But this is universal and absolute, applicable for all believers all the time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The uh, prophet Isaiah says, Surely they may forget, a mother may forget her sucking child, but I will not forget my people. Uh, God has borne our sins upon his own self in the person of Jesus Christ. He has borne our sins away. He has suffered uh, the wrath of God for our on our behalf that we might be saved. How can God, who is absolute and good and wise and just and holy and kind, forget his people? We shall surely forget him as we often do because of our own sin, because of our own forgetfulness, but he will never forget us. He careth for us. Therefore, cast all your care upon him. And therefore, we are to bear afflictions with patience, knowing they come from his kind and fatherly disposal. God does not afflict us except what his kindness has provided for us. And therefore, in all of our afflictions, we are to regard God as a loving father. And if it is too much for us, we, are, we can call out and cry out to him in our affliction, as many of the saints do, as David does many times in the Psalms. The Psalms were written for our comfort. We can turn to the Psalms and read where David uh, cries out in grief, asking for God to deliver him. Even Christ on the cross cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
a believer may be driven to great grief or despair because of things in this life, and yet we are not to lose hope but to remain confident in God, even as Christ did in his anguish on the cross. Each of us have a life to live, suffering to bear, and therefore let us bear it with patience. This is essential to living under the cross because it is not separated from the plan of salvation, is not separated from God's fatherly uh, love for us. We suffer because God intends for us to suffer. It is a trial of faith. We are being tested to see whether we will continue in obedience, in worship, in confidence, in prayer and thanksgiving, despite all these obstacles. And therefore, essential to living under the cross is bearing afflictions with patience. God has disposed it for us, for our sanctification, for our benefit. And if we love God, it will work out for our good. And if we worship God in the midst of trial, we will see more clearly how it works out for our good. Let us not tempt God to further grieve us or chastise us, bearing our afflictions with complaints and with over much despair and with doubting um, and with a consternation of mind but let us commit all things into his hand who loves us dearly as there are many promises in scripture as Isaiah 40 comfort ye comfort ye my people saith your God speak ye comfort ye believe to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished that her iniquity is pardoned for she hath received the Lord's hand double for our all her sins that is, that God rewards us double in righteousness than what our sins have merited. Our sins have merited eternal torment in hell, but God has not only rewarded us with joy and comfort in this life, which is a single promise, but also in heaven with him forever, which is a double. We have received of the Lord's hand double for, for all our sins. Although, and despite our offenses that we still daily offend God, God has had mercy upon us in Jesus Christ and will reward us double. Therefore, have confidence in his love, for God delights in our confidence despite obstacles. Well, when he chastises us or when he sends hard providences our way, it is incumbent upon us and it is our duty to look upon God with love and with confidence and with the same delight that we had in him when things were going well for us for it is certain that our faith is not tested when things go well for us but when things cross us when something happens that is not according to our desire and plan but we are to submit to god in all things and his plan ought to be our plan and therefore when things happen according to this life that are that cause us grief let us Hold fast this profession of faith in Christ and worship God in sincerity and in holiness, knowing that God accepts our worship through Jesus Christ. And so that is central to living under the cross, is bearing afflictions with patience because God means to exercise us by it. As we can see in the book of James, James chapter 1, one of my favorite books in scripture, James chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, that is, trials, tribulations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and complete, want, wanting nothing or lacking nothing. If and if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed with the wind. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. We have here a promise that our trial and affliction is to work patience in us. For if we were furnished with all graces, if we had love to God, if we had joy in him, if we had kindness and goodness and faithfulness, and we were zealous and devoted servants of God, but it was not tested by trial, we should lack patience and therefore to work patience in us, which is the perfection of all of our um, graces our grace of love to God, our grace of faith, our grace of joy, these are tested by trial. And therefore, when they are tried, then they all are endowed with that element and grace of patience. And then they are perfected because before they were untested and untried. But God tries us by 
these grievous uh, afflictions and our graces being exercised in them are perfected and therefore we come through as gold as peter also says in his um epistle the trying of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire that is grievous and hard afflictions yet me might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of jesus christ bearing afflictions with patience is essential to our calling as Christians, and therefore let us not give God reason to afflict us further, to show us that we are impatient under trial, to quicken us, but let us submit to him immediately upon the first sign of trial, and let us cast our cares upon him, knowing that he careth for us dearly. Hath he not bought us with his precious blood, sending his son to die on the cross for our sin, giving his whole life as a sacrifice for us? Therefore, how shall we not also give him our lives in return? And therefore, let us deny self and bear our afflictions with patience. And then fourthly, was the introduction, the main cause and the main context of taking up the cross which is suffering persecution for the sake of the gospel which we have already spoke of on length but this was a point on this just to show forth that this is the most important point and this is the um, or I should say this is the most expressive point this is that which God delights in when we suffer for the sake of his word which is a conscience conscious and deliberate act that is when we do something which is gospel truth or gospel holiness and it offends others for the sake of righteousness not for the sake of offending them we do not mean harm to others either to their conscience or to their life but when it comes into conflict with sin um, it is necessary for us to um, hold forth the gospel banner as a light that um, rips through the darkness and exposes men's sins to them, then it is necessary to wound their conscience for the sake of the gospel, and then will they oppose us, and we will receive persecution for the sake of the gospel. This pleases God when we lose out on things of this world for the sake of the next world. This is the whole context of taking up the cross and following after Christ. That other men may be running, um, a race, but we are to run as with a cross. That is, we are impeded in the things in this life. We take things slowly. We do not pursue zealously after the enjoyment of the things in this life. And yet, God will bless our enjoyment of the things in this life because of our worship of him. Because when we worship God, we know that all things are for his sake and not our own. And that adds an element of peace that we can um, enjoy in the things in this life and therefore whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do do all to the glory of god as paul says in first corinthians and that is the context is that when we suffer immediately and conscientiously for the sake of the gospel god is well pleased this is what it means to take up the cross there is no greater way to live for christ and to live as Christ was our example to live in the manner of how Christ lived, then to take up his cross. It is common in modern culture for others to watch either movies or media or sports and to attempt to imitate their favorite uh, actors or their favorite uh, athletes as um Famous athletes have certain unique celebrations after they score or after they claim victory. They have their jerseys and shirts that men purchase in order to imitate them because they want to be like them. But what greater way is there to be like Christ than to suffer for the sake of the gospel? This is our calling in life, to be holy and to be holy before men, that they might see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven, both in offending us and also on the last day. That is, um, being offended because of us and also on the last day when all things shall be revealed, uh, God shall reveal to them their iniquity and our perfection in Christ, and that we were living consistently according to good order and according to God's law, which is the supreme rule of life. And therefore, we are to live in such a way as not intentionally brings persecution on us, but that is ready to suffer persecution wholly, separate from others, that they may see our good works and glorify God.
Uh, secondly, the second point, which is essential to living under the cross, is prayer and thanksgiving. Prayer and thanksgiving is, is an essential part of the Christian life. And the reason I put this in context with uh, living under the cross is because prayer and thanksgiving is, is often inhibited by suffering. And therefore, this is the point at hand that we are to pray and to be thankful for God despite present grievances. Also, with joy and love and continuing steadfast therein. So, whether we be afflicted or whether we be in comfortable circumstances, it is nevertheless our duty to pray and thank God for our daily meat. Whatsoever we have received of his hand, we are to thank him for. We are to bless him for. And as we have received salvation in Christ, this is chief among our blessings. As we, as we have received grace of the Holy Spirit, this is chief of our blessings. And therefore, we are to thank God for it. We are to thank God for implanting us with love, with implanting us with faith, to believe Christ, with zeal for his doctrine, for a mind to know and understand things contrary to the way the rest of the world understands it, the way the rest of the church understands it. We are to thank God despite um, our circumstances. We are Our duty is to pray and to pray without ceasing. As we before noted, the parable in Luke, that Christ set forth this parable unto his disciples, that men should pray and cease not. I believe it's Luke chapter 18. And so this is our duty, to pray and never to cease praying, because God hears our prayers. And so, as we did not read the entire parable the last time we quoted this, we are going to today, for the sake of context, to encourage us all to pray without ceasing, because God hears the prayers of his people. As we have before said, God cares dearly for us. Luke 18, Christ spoke a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth." Prayer and thanksgiving and asking God for things we have already asked him for many times is a sign of faith. If we continue asking, is it not a sign that we know that he shall give it to us, if he will? And therefore we are exhorted, even if we have not received it as of yet, we are exhorted to pray and to pray for it without ceasing. Because God will give gifts to his people when they ask in faith. And what is an evidence of asking in faith? is to ask without ceasing, to pray and not to faint. In verse 1 of Luke 18, hear what the unjust judge said. He said, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. This is saying that God is more willing to give than we are to ask. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. For he that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, the door shall be opened. This is in the context of prayer. Ask and never stop asking. We are... God is more ready to give us of what we request, even if it is something that we do not yet partake of. God is more willing to give it than we are to ask. But God would have us ask to exercise our faith. It is not for our benefit that we receive it, but it is for our benefit that we are exercised in faith and that we are taught to continually pray for it, that God may be glorified in all things and that his wisdom might be demonstrated in withholding gifts from us. 
And therefore are we exhorted to pray with thanksgiving and to be thankful for what we have and for what we have not. And with joy and love. These are essential elements in prayer. If we are not praying with love to God and with joy for that which we have in the gospel, first of all, and then also the comfortable things that we have in this life, if we are not praying with love and joy, we are praying with a dead heart. Uh, joy and love are essential elements to our thanksgiving. That is, that we are joyful despite our present grievances, that we love God even of those things that he has deprived us with, and we are thankful for what we have, and we are thankful that God has not given us what he has not given us. And then finally, continuing steadfast therein, we are to pray and never to cease praying because it is a sign of faith and confidence that we know God will give it when he pleases. God would exercise our patience and exercise our faith, though we wait long for it. And therefore we are to pray and to pray without ceasing. This is an essential element of living under the cross. If we live under the cross, we will learn to pray despite our present grievances. We will pray with love and joy and contentment in what we have, and we will continue steadfast therein. And then the final point is our behavior and deportment in this life, looking unto life eternal, looking forward unto life eternal. Um, for the sake of length, I was uh, going to originally read Calvin's comments uh, or Calvin's institutes on the life of the patriarchs. Perhaps as a uh, introduction, we will read that some another, another time because it is such an excellent statement of Christian perseverance. Uh, but for the sake of brevity... Um, I will only recommend that you read it. I believe it's book 2, chapter 11, if I'm not mistaken, on Abraham and the patriarchs living according to faith and looking for an eternal inheritance because there were many um, heretics who said that the Old Testament patriarchs only had this life to look forward to and they did not have the promises of the gospel. But Calvin, in true Christian spirit, shows the right context of Scripture, shows that Hebrews 11 writes that by faith, they were able to persevere, and by faith they lived, and that is how we live in this life. That is what it means to take up the cross, to live by faith in Christ, and to look forward to life eternal, knowing that this life is not our life. And to show that this, is, this matches the immediate context, look at what Christ says in both Matthew 10 and Matthew uh, 16. He that finds his life shall lose it, but he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10, 39. To find our life in this life is what is Set is what is spoken here. And he that loseth his life, that is, he that is willing to lose his life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, shall find it. Just as Christ called his disciples as they were mending their nets, as they were fishermen, they left their boats, they left their present calling to follow Christ and to be preachers of the gospel. This is what was meant. And therefore, uh, as Christ calls us um, to do a certain work, we are to leave um behind that which would inhibit that work and to pursue grace and holiness and the calling of the gospel. And so um, here you can see that the context is this life and looking forward to the next life. As Hebrews 13 also says, so we are speaking of the cross, we are speaking of taking up the cross and following after Christ unto eternal life, looking for the next life and not this life. Hebrews 13, starting with verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meat which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Now this is the concluding argument of Hebrews. Paul is speaking to Christians who were before Jews. So he's making a relevant contrast between Jewish worship, which is false, which is hypocritical, just as we do with the Reformed Church today. We constantly rebuke their false worship in true Christian spirit. 
just as Martin Luther and Calvin did of the pap papists in their day, and as the Puritans did with the Socinians, the Arminians, and the Catholics, which were opposed to the gospel. So Paul, in true Christian spirit, makes a contrast between true and false worship, saying that we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. That is, that those that were serving the physical tabernacle had no right to partake of the true tabernacle, which was Christ. We have an altar. And then he says in verse 11, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priests for sin are burnt without the camp. This is speaking of the cross. This is speaking of our suffering in this life. That we are burned without the camp. Without, outside of community among men. We are estranged from men. We are, as it were, killed by men, and our blood is brought without the camp. For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burnt without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. That is, that Christ was persecuted as a malefactor for the sake of the gospel. That Christ was sacrificed and offered up for sin in true Christian fashion, and according to the prophecies of the scripture, outside the camp as a accursed sacrifice. That is, that he was forsaken by the men of this world. He was persecuted by the men of this world. He lived outside the camp, as it were. And then he immediately says, After, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, with for such sacrifices God is well pleased. So here he's speaking of life under the cross, is the immediate context that as the bodies of those beasts under the Old Testament was their blood was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin. They were burnt outside the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. That is, that he might be a unique atonement and he might suffer as a wonder and amazement among men. He was persecuted. There is no glory among men in believing in the cross. And that is the difference between us and the large part of the evangelical world, is that they take the cross of Christ as a sign of pride. They wear it on them, and they boast that they are Christians, but they do not know what the gospel is. They cannot suffer for the gospel. They use it as a means to boast over others that they are better than others uh, because of their profession. But we boast only in Christ and the glories of his gospel, knowing that in this life we will only receive suffering because of the doctrine that brings contest and brings opposition towards men. And so we can see that, wherefore Jesus also, that he might say, sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his Reproach. This is what it means to live under the cross, to bear his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You see how this all fits together. How living under the cross, suffering persecution, suffering afflictions in this life, prayer and thanksgiving, and continuing in prayer and thanksgiving are all the same doctrine. We are speaking of living under the cross. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. This is what Paul is speaking of at the end of Hebrews. This is our calling in life. To obey the call of the gospel, to heed the voice of the word of God in the ministry of the word, by the preaching of the word, to continue therein steadfast to continue in prayer and thanksgiving, to submit to God in all things, to bear afflictions with patience, looking forward unto eternal life, loving not the things that are in the world, neither pursuing the things that are in the world, because if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, knowing that all loss and grievance will be recompensed, everything that we lose out on in this life, God promises his disciples that they will receive tenfold more, if not in this life, then in also the life to come. Whatever we don't have in this life, we will receive in the eternal life. Um, as Christ promised his disciples when he sent them out to preach the word. 
So all loss and grievance is promised to be recompensed. He will wipe away all tears from off our eyes. That is that whatsoever grief we have experienced in this life will be recompensed tenfold in the life to come. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Or is it 2 Corinthians? Second Corinthians 4, verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. That is, that when we suffer persecution for the sake of Christ and deny ourselves and are deprived of those pleasures, that other men enjoy for the sake of the gospel the life of Jesus is manifest in our body for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh so then death worketh in us but life in you we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written I believed and therefore have I spoken we also believe and therefore speak knowing that he which raised the Lord Jesus shall raise us up by Jesus and shall shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might be through thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. He is saying that we receive not only through asking, but through thanksgiving, that we receive benefit by thanking God for it, even if we have it not, because we have confidence that he will give us all that we desire, if it be according to his will. Verse 15 of chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundance of grace might be through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And therefore, this is the final point, that we look forward unto life eternal. Here, just as Paul says, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. We look at the eternal kingdom, just as Paul also says in Hebrews chapter 12, which we just read for chapter 13. And chapter 12, he says, This word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Here we have the promise of everlasting life, and of a kingdom which cannot be moved. We are exhorted in the word not to love the world not to pursue the world although we are um, permitted by God to enjoy things in this world and to ask him for things in this world but we are not to love the world that is as he says as we read in Matthew 10 take up your cross and follow me he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me he that finds his life in this life will lose it but he that loses his life shall save it. This is the calling that all Christians are called to, to live under the cross, to love not the world, for all loss and grievance will be recompensed. And then two final doctrinal observations on this point, looking forward to eternal life. God's enemies shall be destroyed. All of those who are in enmity and not in conformity to God's law and word, as we have preached, the doctrine of the law and gospel, the doctrine of God's grace, the doctrine of um, living under the cross in humiliation and self-denial and taking up the cross and following after uh, Jesus Christ in suffering for his gospel, for his sake. All of these who do not come in conformity with this shall be destroyed. And therefore the application is be reconciled to God. Labor, be very zealous to appertain to eternal life and to know whether or not eternal life is yours. Examine your hearts. Examine the word. Examine the preaching of the word in the reformers and the Puritans. See if your doctrine is theirs or no. And those who are not in conformity with those blessed men who have preached before and who have not come into conformity with this doctrine which we preach on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis, 
those who do not conform, come into conformity with this word shall be destroyed. We are not preaching that which is only beneficial, but that which is life and death. Those who believe the word of God shall be saved. Those who do not believe shall be damned. And therefore, be reconciled to God. Search your own hearts whether this applies to you or no. Whether you are in hypocrisy or no. Whether you are sincerely and zealously uh, pursuing the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Whether this religion is your life and your chief pursuit is the things of God. Uh, because it is certain that God's enemies shall be destroyed in the last day, but God's friends, those who are called his by his word, are obedient to his word and zealous for his cause. A second observation, doctrinal observation, I'm looking forward unto life eternal, is that God's friends shall be glorified. All those who come into conformity with God's law, by his Holy Spirit, teaching them the exactness of the law, the glory of God, and his holiness, and his justice, and the gospel in Jesus Christ, the free righteousness imputed to us by grace, given to us by the Holy Spirit, who works that faith in us, God's friends who come into conformity with this shall be glorified. Therefore, application be reconciled to your neighbor. Let there be no unnecessary fightings or disputings among believers, because we will all be glorified on the last day. We are all equally justified, we are all being sanctified, and we will all be glorified before God and His Father before Christ and His Father before all the holy angels. And therefore, as we shall be judged uh, before God, as Christians, let us be reconciled to our neighbor in this life. Let there be no unnecessary disputings or cavilings or undone affections, but let us be sincere uh, and open and honest with each other, and let us not bark and destroy each other, as Paul warns in 1 Corinthians, that there were um, separations and... Um, that there were uh, contentions, and that's one person said, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos, but Christ is not divided. We are one body in Christ. All those that believe the gospel shall receive everlasting life, and therefore let us be reconciled to God, let us be reconciled to our neighbor. And therefore, in conclusion, this is what it means to live under the cross. First, it means to be persecuted for the sake of the gospel. This is to be persecuted for the sake of religion. That is, whether it is our profession of the truth, which is correct doctrine, or our profession of holiness. That is, we desire to live holy and we reject the sinful things of the world. There are many things in this world that may be enjoyed uh, with a pure conscience, and there are many things in this world that people enjoy um, def with a defiled conscience that a Christian should not um, enjoy. And therefore, when it can comes into conflict uh, with holiness, with sincerity, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us rather be willing to suffer persecution for the sake of holiness than to suffer shame for the sake of the cross and then God will be displeased with us and bring his fatherly chastisement upon us uh, because we are not ready to be persecuted for the gospel. Uh, but let us, as many as are spiritually minded, be well disposed to um, know sound doctrine, to love sound doctrine, to live according to it, though it bring persecution upon us for the sake of it. Um, let us bear our afflictions with patience, as we know that God intends to exercise our graces by it, for we cannot know how strong our love to God is, our joy in the gospel is, except we be tested and tried by hard providences. Let us bear our afflictions with patience, knowing that God loves his people dearly. He has promised an everlasting paradise for us, and our duty is simply to wait for it, to worship him in sincerity and love and zeal and devotion, and the everlasting kingdom of God in heaven will be ours. And so this is what it means to take up the cross, to pray with thanksgiving, to never cease praying, to, to pray with, with love and joy despite present grievances and to continue steadfast therein, even as is exhorted in the Gospels, to pray and to cease not. And then finally, looking unto life eternal, this is the substance of the Christian life. This is all of our sanctification and all of our progress in the faith is going forward, is pursuing after godliness. Um, being zealously devoted for, to the ordinances of God, to the means of grace, to his word, 
to our sanctification and to desire that which God desires. We are exhorted in the word not to love the world, for if any love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that we lose out on in this life shall be recompensed. All the suffering that comes upon us, all the grief, God will make up for it. He has promised to do so in heaven. If not in this life, he will do so in heaven. Therefore, let us have faith and ask in confidence whatsoever we desire, knowing that God is well pleased to grant our desire. If it be for our benefit... And therefore, let us know that God's enemies shall be destroyed as we look unto life eternal. And therefore, be reconciled to God and be not friends with the world. Be not unequally yoked together with the enemies of God, knowing that they shall be punished in flames, in everlasting hellfire forever. But only as we may be an example to them and show forth God's glory in his gospel. And then finally, God's friends shall be glorified. And therefore, be reconciled to your neighbor. Um, love one another. Uh, live in sacrificial love, uh, bearing with one another's infirmities, for we know that we all have sin and we all are called to bear with each other's sins for the sake of the gospel. God bears with our sins daily. Can we not bear with each other's sins when occasion calls for it? And therefore, be reconciled to your neighbor. They are friends. They are called beloved for the sake of the gospel. That is our calling in life. And therefore, take up the cross Follow after Christ, even as he has called us as his disciples. He that finds his life will lose it, but he that loses his life for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ, shall find it. And so let's pray. Our merciful and faithful Father in heaven, thou who art holy and righteous, Lord of heaven and earth, thou hast created all things for thine own glory, and dost preserve them according to thine own goodness and justice. We have sinned and forfeited the precious gifts that were ours by creation, and we have brought upon ourselves a world of trouble, sorrow, and anguish by the fall. Be pleased, therefore, to have mercy upon us, as we are the flock of thy possession, whom thou hast called to thyself in love. Seal the promises of the gospel in our hearts, and make us content, joyful, and composed, even amidst much opposition, both from the contempt of man and the turning of providence. Try us, but do it according to justice, according to the promises of the word, that we faint not, for we are unable of our own strength to persevere. Keep us in the faith by grace, and increase us by the power of the word, that we might be faithful servants, inclined to thy will from the heart. Give us such a heart, O Lord, ready to serve and worship and pray with confidence and joy in all circumstances. And may we ever bless the name of Jesus Christ, who alone is worthy of all honor and glory, who alone can do it. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.